with leaders from the US, UK, and uh, Dutch criminal tax divisions, this will be a great opportunity to learn about and contrast the work done by each. One disclaimer, no statements by anybody on the panel today should be understood as any official position of the agency or company for which they work, and nothing that's said will be legal, tax, financial, or regulatory advice. We will touch on, we will, <laughs> we, okay. <laughs> Buy Bitcoin, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but just kidding. We'll talk about seizures of crypto, collaboration with other law enforcement agencies domestically and internationally, um, the increasing number of cases that have traditional tax elements rather than conduct that is purely criminal in nature, and we'll talk also about the new programs to enhance the effectiveness of agency activities. Let's jump in. Press reports in the U.S., Jim, have indicated that the IRS has seized more than $7 billion in crypto in 2022. The Dutch and the U.K. have also made also material crypto procedures. Jim, is it correct to assume that the IRS isn't a hodler and looking to liquidate some of the crypto seized? It's an awesome question. <laughs> All right. All right. We're not hiring 87,000 armed agents first for anybody following uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, tax uh, system. All right. And I do have to thank Chainalysis real quick before we jump in. I know we're on a clock. Uh, but thanks for the opportunity to come and talk about the uh, division that I lead, somewhere I've worked 28 years my entire adult career. Um, great to share the stage with HMRC and FIAD, my colleagues here. And uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to be surrounded by a team of uh, investigators that I have here. We're actually going over to uh, uh, Germany to train some Ukrainian soldiers uh, uh, in how to trace uh, crypto um, in these financial investigations later this week. So it's awesome to have this opportunity. All right, your question. No, we're not hodlers of uh, crypto. Uh, from, the, from the US government standpoint, we do have, a, where we are sitting on about 10 billion in value at the time of seizure. Okay, I don't want it. There's a risk to have it. Okay, um, we're constantly trying to mitigate those risks. There's several challenges with it, um, and I think when you talk about that volume of uh, uh, crypto, um, I have to secure it. Uh, I have to account for it. Um, I have to store it safely so it doesn't get stolen, and then. Uh, to say that it's challenging uh, is an incredible understatement. Um, and just for those that might not know how this works, um, any asset that I'm going to, I, when I talk about seizures, I can really talk about any asset. Crypto adds some additional challenges. But there's a huge time challenge, there's a time commitment to actually gather the evidence necessary um, to actually be able to produce a court order to seize any asset uh, derived from illicit activity. I suppose that the, the, you got that time challenge. It doesn't change with uh, crypto. You have multiple years of litigation that you have to go through in order to move a seized asset to be able to actually forfeit it. That takes time. It adds, it's incredibly challenging. So then once we, once we uh, have it, you know, you've got the value fluctuation. Like I said, it was 10 billion we were sitting on. I think that was when it was 60,000. It's about half that now, roughly, but that's constantly changing. And there's accounting, there's media, there's a lot of things that I have to deal with, uh, very challenging there. All right, now let's say we're lucky enough, the litigation is over. We move from the seizure process, we now forfeit it, okay? Um, now what I gotta worry about, and believe me, we are thinking about this, when I'm sitting on that much cryptocurrency, I think of, okay, what is my threshold to get this back into the system? You know, I don't really want to create a, um, uh, like a blockage discount and lower the value. I want a fair market value for it, uh, right? You know, and so we are constantly thinking about what that looks like. We typically work with the U.S. Marshal Service in order to, uh, in order to liquidate that, uh, th those assets. And then, again, the, the, the challenges don't, they don't stop there. Um, once we forfeit something, Though that money is um, available and Congress can see it and it's subject to rescission. So Congress could come and take that money once it hits that forfeited uh, uh, status. Victims can come forward and they can put a claim on that. So again, adding more time. 
you know, to the seizure and forfeiture and liquidation process. And then ultimately, once all that's done, maybe I get a very small fraction of it to help from a law enforcement purpose. I can put in an initiative and I can actually try to claim some of that to help run the division along with other law enforcement uh, uh, as well. So to say it's challenging is an understatement, but no, not a hodler. Uh, I'd rather seize it, uh, help make the space safe, and then, and then move it on. Wow. Niels, does any of that resonate with the experience in the Netherlands? Well, it's good to say uh, we're now living in 2023, and 10 years ago we had our first seizure of a Bitcoin. Wow. And it, that was quite new, but, but still a little bit quite new. We, we raised the knowledge about how the system works, how the ecosystem with cryptocurrency works, uh, but, but still very challenging uh, to, be, uh, to, to create enough knowledge in, in how to seizure the goods. Uh, what's very interesting it was uh, two years ago, uh, as everybody maybe know from a law enforcement perspective, there was a lot of PGP data was collected, uh, very interesting uh, data sets, and it makes it possible to uh, seize about 30 million euros uh, from, uh, from criminals. Um, we see um, in an increasing way the use of cryptocurrency in all kinds of crime that are not only on tax, but also in money laundering, in drug trafficking, trafficking, all kind of criminality. Cryptocurrency is a very uh, interesting part of uh, criminal money. Um, still, we are very looking forward to a new draft bill, the so-called NCBC in the Netherlands, the non-conviction based confiscation, because as Jim mentioned, uh, um, to come to a, to a, a conviction can last for about seven years with appeal and that kind of stuff. And to wait till that moment to get a seizure in the sense of getting it forfeit is of course a long time. So we're very much looking forward to that draft bill that gives us more opportunities to be more effective from a law enforcement perspective. Wow, powerful. Adrian, does any of that resonate with the UK? Absolutely. Um, similar to what, what Niels was saying, at the moment we can only conduct crypto seizures sort of post arrest. Um, however, we've got legislation going through at the moment under the um, Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill, which will hopefully land in the autumn, which means that we'll, um, it will re remove that arrest requirement for crypto seizures and, and give us sort of much, a much broader disruptive power in that space. Um, Similar to what Jim was saying in the, the volatile nature of the asset, what we've done to try and address that is move um, the responsibility or the decision making over to the suspects. So when we seize assets, we effectively, through their legal representatives, make them choose whether to liquidate the asset at point of seizure or to keep it as the asset. Therefore, any fluctuations in the market the risk is transferred to them rather than it sitting with us. Um, we've also, and people have probably heard me speak about our NFT seizures before, but um, we're working with sort of UK regulated vendors to see about how we realize NFTs without um, sort of distorting their value or putting them back into the marketplace um, in, in the wrong sort of the wrong timings, etc. And under the, the Economic Crime Bill, we also are going to get the powers to destroy or remove assets from the marketplace, from the ecosystem completely. Obviously, that's something in the future, and it will probably be very niche circumstances, but it's really useful to have that ability if, if no other option is available to us. It, so. inter interesting in the context of uh, some of the pump and dumps where the coin might have no value. I see that be very relevant. Um, speaking of that, um, Tax agencies often collaborate with other domestic law enforcement. An example of this is a recent guilty plea in a criminal tax invasion by the issuance of the Pearl tokens. Their SEC reports, the US Securities Exchange Commission, um, also pursued actions against people um, behind the Pearl token issuance for unregistered security offerings. Jim, is this something new where multiple law enforcement agencies are pursuing action against defendants for matters within their jurisdiction? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, and I'm glad you asked that because uh, 
Look, um, I work, I'm in the business of money crimes, okay? I work for the IRS, so of course I'm interested in tax cases. But we work 100% of our time on money crimes. We work with the Bureau, DEA, ATF, a lot of these law enforcement agencies. They do financial investigations as well, but we partner every day with local, county, state, federal uh, uh, authorities um, on tax and other financial crimes, both domestically and internationally. And I, I like to think of it as, um, if, if, if you think about a question, um, what has changed in financial crimes in the past 40 years? Okay. I would tell you, from my view, nothing has changed. What has changed is the speed at which money uh, can move, um, uh, the evolution of digital assets making it anonymous, but yet, or that, so they think it's anonymous. Money laundering services, the criminal enterprises aren't the ones laundering the money anymore. Um, they actually hire professional enablers to do that. And the complexity of these money laundering transactions are, you know, six and seven audit trails deep. So it's very complex. So we have, like the, the genesis, the theme of this links, we have to partner with each other, both public and private. So we do it all the time. Now, we all agree also that technology advancements are great. Blockchain is outstanding. Uh, not a, nobody is against that in law enforcement. I think it's great for the speed, uh, the energy. You know, people can, you know, it, it helps people. So why would we not want uh, this type of uh, advancement technology? I think, but as we all know, we're all experienced enough to know that even though it's a small sector, crypto is a small sector of the criminal activity out there, it still equates to big dollars and people are going to take advantage of people. And you, know, you mentioned the Pearl Token case. Um, oftentimes with federal agencies in the states anyway, it's more of a charging strategy of the prosecutor. If somebody has a U.S. tax fine obligation, we can charge them with tax. I mean, money laundering is tax evasion in progress. So it really just depends on the prosecutor that we're working with. And you, know, you mentioned Pearl Token, but think about you know, Hydra, Bitfinex, Silk Road. These are cases my division led. You, know, you mentioned that NFT. We did an NFT seizure on the uh, Frosty, uh, Frosties, if you remember, out of New York. It was like a utility token. It's almost a, a, a Ponzi scheme. We're supposed to be using a metaverse game. They just stole that money. BitConnect, a, a $2 billion case. Again, these are public-private partnership cases, terrorist financing. You know, the welcome to video case is one of our first cases with uh, chain analysis in a, in a, a public-private partnership setting where we actively save 23 kids from getting raped every day. You know, pretty powerful stuff to be able to stop. So um, that list goes on, but let me get to what you had just real quick. Uh, digital assets, I mean, do have a direct intersection with our tax system. And you mentioned, uh, um, the Pearl Token, Mr. Elmani. Um, but we also have BitQuick. They were, uh, that was a, a, a Ponzi scheme. About 24 million they stole from investors. We charge money laundering and tax. Um, just, uh, just, just in the past six months, Jayton Gill uh, failed to file returns. He was evading taxes. He's operating an unregistered uh, exchange, just not reporting the crypto. We charged him with tax, charged him with money laundering as well. Um, Gordon Beckestead, uh, a return preparer that was earning money from crypto uh, and just not reporting it. So again, uh, commonly we work with uh, other law enforcement agencies, and that's the sp we can always bring that tax charge to bring the case together, but we work every money crime. So expect to see a lot more um, uh, outward-facing tax cases here in the future. Got it. Neil, so would that kind of collaboration happen amongst your division and other law enforcement agencies as well? well to, to mention uh, one statistic, 80% of our cases, our investigation cases, are uh, cross-border cases. Wow. Uh, of course, the Netherlands is uh, quite a small country, but still, 80%, it's, it's quite a lot. And um, I, I think that uh, cryptocurrency is symptomatic for it. It's uh, money, also criminal money, money flows around the world at a highly speed. Uh, it's anonymous and it's very speedy and it's simple. And that, that makes that we have to collaborate. It, it's very good that we're sitting with the three, three of us. We are a part of the J5, the Joint Five, the chiefs of the global tax enforcement, uh, tax, uh, uh, law enforcement agencies. And together with uh, CRA in Canada and ATO in Australia, 
we form a strong coalition uh, also on tax matters, on cryptocurrency matters, to share our knowledge, to share data sets, to do shared investigations. We not only do it uh, internationally, also domestically with public partners, with police, with uh, the tax office, but also um, with private partners. We need private partners as well. So it's good to be here uh, because we all have to stand shoulder on shoulder in tackling uh, uh, money laundering, other forms of crime, because nobody can do it alone. Got it. And Adrian, does HMRC uh, get involved where in cases that blend both tax and non-tax? Uh, absolutely. I mean, any uh, to echo comments already, any crime that involves money has a tax element to it. Um, so in the crypto asset space, we have multiple working groups with multiple law enforcement partners across the UK um, to make sure that that we're not sort of siloing ourselves away and only dealing with tax matters. We want to be forward leaning. We want to explore, make sure that every disruptive option is, is fully explored when it comes to any criminal case, because if there's not sufficient evidence to prosecute for the original offense, um, as was mentioned, there are likely to be tax offenses. We can go after that in a civil capacity. So we make sure that we work hand in hand with, with law enforcement across the UK um, and, and just keep those, those relationships running because as, as was mentioned, professional money launderers, they don't care what the original crime is, they'll work to anything if there's, there's money involved for them. So, um, so we need to make sure that we don't have those artificial boundaries because the criminals don't um, and we're just hamstringing ourselves if we, if we don't really. Got it. And we touched a bit about this, about multilateral collaboration. Um, and Niels, let me start with you. Uh, you leaned into it a bit, um, but can you talk about um, the ways that the Netherlands are collaborating with other international law enforcement agencies, whether they be multilateral agencies uh, in other countries and also the J5, to the extent you're expanding on your prior comments? Yeah, it's not only in a, in a more institutionalized way like the J5 is, but uh, from the Netherlands' perspective, we had a lot of connections with, uh, for instance, the Zoll Kriminalamt, the customs agency in, in, uh, um, in Germany, uh, working a lot together with, uh, with Belgium, France, Italy. Um, um, and that's necessary to tackling uh, crime effectively. So uh, it, it's a must to do. So all our investigators uh, uh, have to be well aware of what's going on on the scene of, for instance, cryptocurrency but also how to make connections to other countries and how to react on that. That's very, uh, very uh, promising in improving uh, tackling crime. Got and, and Jim, many countries consider the, the J5 to be successful, uh, an example of effective collaboration between tax agencies. And publicly, there are some tangible things that the member countries are doing. One is known as the J5. What is that? Yeah. Um, J5 challenge, sorry. J5 challenge, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, can I just take a quick sidestep? Uh, uh, something I forgot to mention. Um, you know, when I talk about context and cases, uh, I have hundreds of cases in inventory and, uh, uh, that involve crypto at various stages. Um, and something, it, it, it's an observation. Um, three to five years ago, uh, they were all money laundering cases. Uh, today, it's about a 50-50 split between tax and money laundering. Now again, a lot of those tax cases are going to have the, the Ponzi scheme, the embezzlement, and the money laundering charge available. Um, but I've, I've really started to see a shift because of that direct intersection. All right, the J5 challenge. <clears throat> and it, is, uh, it does relay into it. It's just something you need to think of. This is great. Um, the value of the J5 challenge, I, I, I mean, I can't say it enough. It's, uh, it's incredibly energizing for me. Um, here's what it is. The J5, we bring in, um, in a public-private partnership setting, subject matter experts. Think of officers, analysts, uh, private sector tools with real information, you know, that we're legally allowed to share, okay? I figuratively lock them in a room. And I'm looking around to see if anybody's eyes get, well, a couple guys got big. I don't really lock them in a room, but I like to say that. And I say, look, when you come out of here, you, you have to produce results with this information that you have. And what do I mean? I mean operational results, uh, case leads for each of the five jurisdictions 
to actually come back and, and work. Um, and one of the things that we did, we just did one, we did our fourth chapter, it focused on decentralized exchange and NFTs, came, uh, came away with a number of NFT leads. We came away with a $1 billion Ponzi scheme that impacted all five jurisdictions. And you know, I'm happy to say that that's turned into a full-blown investigation at this point. Um, uh, incredibly excited about that. We're working on our fifth chapter of the challenge. Um, there's multiple themes being discussed. And this is all in the crypto uh, you know, kind of cyber environment. One of the things that's pretty uh, close to me is uh, developing leads and operational leads using Bank Secrecy Act data. Um, and so one of the themes for this next crypto challenge will be bank filings from each of the respective jurisdictions that we're allowed to share that involve crypto. We're going to try to use that to generate leads. So incredibly powerful. Um, I can tell you right now, I would not have some of the investigations I have in inventory if it wasn't for this J5 challenge in the public-private partnership setting, which is so important. Important. Wow. And Adrian, can you speak about the effectiveness of multilateral collaboration in your agency? Yeah, so within, within the UK, we have um, a, a, a specialist group that, that runs um, to facilitate those public-private partnerships that are so important. So we have the, um, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligent, Intelligence Task Force, bit of a mouthful, so it's just Jim Lit. Um, but what that does is bring together multiple law enforcement agencies from across the UK. It brings in relevant private partners, um, and it explores both sort of leads and cases that can be moved forward. So to date, under that relationship, there's been um, 200, over 280 arrests, over 86 million pounds seized through leads generated through the Gimlet. Um, there's four for private sector sort of financial firms. We've created, uh, generated 7,400 suspect accounts that have been identified. Um, and launched over 6,000 investigations within the, the private sector. So we in the crypto space are learning from that and effectively we know it works so well. So it's something that we want to start developing, we want to look more into. Um, we have clear evidence of this public-private public partnerships working in not just financial crime but in the, the sort of fintech space. And so it's definitely something we want to we want to push forward with. We want to use more more of and get more people around the table. Um, and then we use that model in our engagement with the J5, with our engagement with other international partners. We can sort of hold that up almost as like a gold standard um, that we want to try and replicate. Got it. We're t the theme we're talking about is multilateral, multilateral collaboration and addressing um, some of the challenges around crypto. The, talent, the challenges are basically technology related, getting access to data abroad, and developing collaborative relationships with local law enforcement. Uh, Adrian, can you talk about how the UK is double tapping and addressing these challenges and enablement? Yeah, so obviously with the borderless nature of, of most financial technology now, but specifically crypto assets in this space, as has been mentioned before, it allows people to um, jurisdiction jump quite easily, quicker than they ever have before. Um, so we have challenges in identifying the obfuscation methods that people are using, that, those layering techniques, um, the final destination of, of assets. Um, to do this, to, to help tackle this, um, we have financial crime liaison officers who are based uh, across the world. We cover just over 100 countries now um, to have a presence. And those individuals are there. They're responsible for leading the relationships with law enforcement, with tax and customs authorities, with border authorities. They're our people out on the ground driving those relationships forward. Um, they're there to, in some jurisdictions, help with capacity building. Um, similar to what Jim has said, that they're going out to help train sort of the Ukrainians. We do that in other jurisdictions around the world as well, trying to upskill people um, and, and also learn from them. There's a lot of knowledge sharing there. People, you know, will have, will have found things out that we've not yet. So we want to make sure that we can develop in those spaces. Um, and it also sort of 
really helps in generating joint operations and joint casework so that um, effectively what we can try and do is um, identify, identify new and emerging threats. Um, we're launching a specific horizon scanning team um, or element of the team to, to look at what is the what's the next Bitcoin? What's the next thing on the horizon that criminals are going to look to exploit? Can we get in early? Can we put mitigations in place? Can we make it difficult? I'd love to say impossible, but we all know that's not going to happen. Can we make it difficult for criminals to, um, to exploit it and use it for nefarious means? Got it. And Jim, how are the IRS um, dealing with these kind of multilateral challenges? You know, cause can you talk about things like cyber attaches and ACDC? Yeah. yeah, making it difficult is the name of the game because we can't investigate our way you know, out of it. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot, you know, uh, in that space. Matter of fact, I got an officer sitting here in the back that's part of uh, JCAT, the Joint Cyber Crime Action Task Force, uh, over at Europol. Um, we've got uh, cyber attache posts. We're actually piloting a number of posts uh, as we speak in uh, Singapore, Bogota, Frankfurt, and Sydney. Uh, you know, I mentioned the uh, Ukrainian trainings that we're doing. We do that um, all over the globe in multiple languages. Uh, again. Uh, with our private partners, um, often uh, chain analysis specifically. Uh, so worldwide training, we got a partnership in Pittsburgh. I actually have, the way we originally set this up, I actually have dedicated cyber groups. First one was in our Washington DC office. Uh, it was successful, we replicated that on the west coast in LA. And these are folks that are specifically dedicated to work cyber cases and they're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're specialists and they sit with private partners all the time working these cases. And, you know, this model works so well. Uh, I created an executive section within CI just dedicated to cyber. And one of the things that we're doing, a lot of the cases that I've mentioned, a lot of the success that we've seen have been, they've all been in a public private partnership setting. And, you know, I have uh, 23, 2400 special agents you know, around the country. They're not all specialists in tracing crypto, but they're starting to see this more and more. So how do I, how do I deal with that? One of the things, again, this is something exciting that we're doing. We're building the Advanced uh, Collaboration Center. Uh, we call it the ACDC, just like the rock band. And when I, when I first showed my commissioner you know, the picture of this, I think they did have the album cover. And he said, eh, I like the idea, but that's a copyright problem. So we changed <laughs> it. We keep calling it ACDC. But, Think of it like this. Um, all we did was model what we were doing in individual cases, and we're trying to make this national. So think of a center with public-private partners, other law enforcement, some of our civil side as well, Intel, uh, uh, Intel folks as well. Um, now think of an agent. It's a cyber center. Um, one of the aspects has to do with crypto. Think of an agent around the country um, uh, needs help tracing crypto. They could come into the center. They get interviewed by the subject matter experts in a public-private partnership setting that have the tools uh, and the technology available to help them. They don't just work the case for them. That agent still work in that case. They just give them some direction, train the tools they need, and then off they go. It's more of a centralized way to reach the masses. Think about um, everything I touch these days. When I was an agent in the field, we'd back a semi-tractor trailer up to a business and, and haul off you know, five, 600 boxes of records. And then you're going through the records, you know, trying to figure out what you have. I and mean, it's all digital these days. So think of now seizing you know, uh, three or four servers with terabytes and terabytes of data on it. I mean, how do you deal with that? Maybe, the, maybe there's, you know, there's, the, there's uh, the software's infected, the operating systems don't work. Agents don't, your average agent does not know how to deal with that. They come to the center, they get interviewed by a team. You know, the team helps them with subject matter experts with the tools and the training up to date, help them solve that challenge. You know, so these are just some of the many things that we're doing because we do believe, I mean, it's here. It's not like it, we're going there. I mean, this is the space that we're in. And much like uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, when international was kind of in every case, it's in every case now. Um, when you're talking about crypto, it's, I'm starting to see it in more cases. You know, the future, it's gonna be in every case moving forward. So we're trying to build an infrastructure to be able to deal with that. Um, and then share our knowledge and skill set uh, you know, with other law enforcement, just to make this safe, 
safe for all of us and really small, you know, for the bad actors out there. Yeah, I love it. I love it. We've got about a minute left, and let's find our way home. Niels, can you take us home uh, with some closing thoughts from each of the gentlemen on the stage? Uh, well, maybe two things. Uh, one is um, we don't have an ACDC, we have another rock band, FACT. I don't know if it's a rock band, but it stands, <laughs> it's an abbreviation of a financial advanced cyber teams. But I think one of the challenges that we have experts, but how do we get the knowledge of the experts to the rest of the investigators? Because it cannot only be the world of, an ec or of only a small group of experts. So we, do, we are investing a lot in kind of training programs, how to transfer knowledge, not, not of being all the investigators being an expert, but what they have to know at least to be a good investigator also in the world of crypto. Um, and not already mentioned, we do have a, a strongly re, strong relationship with science, with the Technical University in Delft, because we want to stay in ahead of all the new developments, new methods, how to search in data, how to do that in a proper way. And uh, we need all assets in the, sen in the sense of capabilities that we have in our country and abroad. And uh, Delft University is uh, very much uh, ahead of, uh, of that. So we had a, a strong uh, cooperation with them. I should say that three things are, impossible, are uh, important for us as law enforcement. We have to adapt very quickly, more swift than we do now. We have to be innovative, and we need everybody in the room to be that. And we need collaboration, because nobody can do this, do, do this on its own. That are three very important things, I, uh, I think. Got it. Well, we're out of time. Um, it was great to listen to the various approaches, the successes that each of you were having, and the contrasting uh, approaches that some of you have with regard to domestic practices. So thank you so much for your time and your insights. Okay, thank you. Thank you.